Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Uh, we are in the process of rearranging our recording room. So it's a little bit of a mess and I forgot it was a mess because well, I have ADHD and I forget almost everything. I'm also blending into that black background. So this sweater is coming off so you can see I'm not just a floating head. Am I muted? No. OK, I think I started the stream not being muted, which is a delightful thing. And for those of you who have been with us for a while, know that I usually start live streams muted. So we're doing well this morning, this afternoon, this morning. Yes, still this morning, just about. So thank you everyone for your patience. I appreciate you hanging out with me while I got everything ready. Aunt Jer is asking, do I use Manic Panic? I don't, my head eye is Arctic Fox. I have used Manic Panic in the past. I prefer Arctic Fox for uh, longevity of color for those who are interested in my haircut routine. Um, yeah, the last time it was kind of orange and red and that faded out as orange and red tend to do. So now we are with green because I like green and it makes me happy. And okay, yeah, so today we are going to be reading the Epic of Gilgamesh because it is the 150th anniversary since the rediscovery of the Epic. George Smith discovered, I think, the flood tablets in the British Museum um, 150 years ago last week. Um, there's a link in the description for anyone who wants to go and read a little bit more. And you can also just Google 150 years of Gilgamesh. Um, there'll be a whole bunch of stuff coming up from that. So yeah, I don't know that we're going to get through all of it. I'm going to try. I am going to try, but it is not a small epic. Let's see. Do, do, do. I should have done this earlier, really. I'm sorry. I'm I get my head if it wasn't screwed up. It's it's this much of the book. So we might not get through all of it, but we're going to give it a very good go. And if we don't, then I will be back. Maybe tomorrow, in fact, not Friday. I have to go to Baltimore on Friday, but I'll be back tomorrow and we can read the rest of it. This is the translation by Benjamin Foster. If you, again, are a longtime viewer of the channel, you'll have heard us talk about Dr. Foster before. He um, is the author of the anthology of Acadian literature that we use very regularly called Before the Muses. It's a two volume set. It's amazing. If you're interested in Mesopotamian literature, I highly recommend it. He has little introductions at the beginning of each story kind of giving you some background about what it is where it's from which i find very interesting and i think most other people do if they're interested in the ancient world and in ancient literature they enjoy finding out that kind of information so um this is a new translation it was put out this year i believe i'm going to check that because i don't know for certain do 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 no i lie put out in 2019 still recent in terms of translation history. So I am very much looking forward to reading through it. I've not done that before. Um, so hopefully you enjoy it. I'm going to put some information up on the back of the screen so that people who are interested can find it easily. It's under $20 on Amazon. Um, if you're looking for an affordable copy of the Gilgamesh epic, that's the wrong picture. There we go. That's the one. Um, so highly recommended. I'm just going to I'm going to sit here and do a grown-up story time for everyone. If you have questions, please do put them in the chat. I will answer them uh, as I get to them, if I see them. So, yeah, let's dive in. This is Tablet One. He who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, who knew the world's ways, was wise in all things. Gilgamesh, who saw the wellspring, the foundations of the land, who knew the world's ways, was wise in all things. He it was who studied seats of power everywhere. Full knowledge of it all he gained. He saw what was secret and revealed what was hidden. He brought back tidings from before the flood. From a distant journey came home, weary but at peace. Set out all his hardships on a monument of stone. He built the walls of ramparted Uruk, the lustrous treasury of hallowed Ayana. See its upper wall, which girds it like a cord, Gaze at the lower course, which no one can equal. So for those who don't know, Uruk is the city that Gilgamesh was king of. The Ayana is a temple. Uh, I'll give little explanations of things as I go, if there's stuff that I'm not sure people will know. Um, Mount the wooden staircase there from days of old. Approach Ayana, the dwelling of Ishtar, which no future king, no human being can equal. Go up, pace out the walls of Uruk, 
study the foundation terrace and examine its brickwork. Is it not its masonry of kiln-fired brick? And did not seven masters lay its foundations? One square mile of city, one square mile of gardens, one square mile of clay pits, a half square mile of Ishtar's dwelling. Three and a half square miles is the measurement of Uruk. Open the foundation box of cedar, release its lock of bronze, raise the lid upon its hidden contents, take up and read from the lapis, tabu- the lapis tablet. Of all the miseries that he, Gilgamesh, came through, Surpassing all kings, for his stature renowned, heroic offspring of Uruk, a charging wild bull. He leads the way in the vanguard. He marches at the rear, defender of his comrades. Mighty flood wall, protector of his troops. Furious flood surge, smashing walls of stone. Wild calf of divine Lugalbanda, Gilgamesh is perfect in strength. Suckling of the sublime wild cow, divine Ninsun, Towering Gilgamesh is uncannily perfect. Opening passes in the mountains, digging wells at the highlands' verge, traversing the ocean, the vast sea to the sun's rising, exploring the furthest reaches of the earth, seeking everywhere for eternal life, reaching in his valour Utnapishtim, the distant one, restorer of holy places that the deluge has destroyed, founder of rights for the teeming peoples, who could be his like who could be his like for kingly virtue and who like gilgamesh can proclaim i am king gilgamesh was singled out from the day of his birth two thirds of him was divine one third of him was human to th- the lady of birth drew his body's image the god of wisdom brought his statue to perfection gilgamesh could wrestle with 50 companions wearing out young men every day He kept the young men of Uruk fearful of mistreatment. The locks of his hair grew thick as a grain field. His teeth gleamed like the rising sun. His hair was dark as deep blue strands of wool. Eleven cubits was his height, his chest four cubits wide. A triple cubit his feet, his leg six times twelve. His stride was six times twelve cubits. A triple cubit the beard of his cheek. He was perfection in height. Ideally handsome. In ramparted Uruk, he strode back and forth, lording it like a wild bull, his head thrust high. The onslaught of his weapons had no equal. His companions stood forth for his game stick. He was harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason. Gilgamesh would leave no son to his father. Day and night he would rampage fiercely. Gilgamesh, king of this numberless people, He, the shepherd of ramparted Uruk, Gilgamesh would leave no girl to her mother. Gilgamesh would leave no young woman to her husband. He was their bull, they were the keen. A bitter clamour rose up to the sky. The warriors stood the young man's chosen. Ishtar kept hearing their plaints. Their bitter complaint reached the heaven of Anu. The gods of heaven, the lords who commanded, said to Anu, Have you created a headstrong wild bull in ramparted Uruk? The onslaught of his weapons has no equal. His companions stand forth by his game stick. He is harrying the young men of Uruk beyond reason. Gilgamesh leaves no son to his father. Day and night he rampages fiercely. This is the shepherd of ramparted Uruk. This is the people's shepherd. Bold, superb, accomplished, Gilgamesh leaves no young woman to her husband. The warrior's daughter, the young man's chosen, Anu kept hearing their plaints. Anu speaks. Let them summon Aruru, the great one. She created the human race. Let her create a match for Gilgamesh, mighty in strength. Let them contend with each other, that Uruk may have peace. They summoned Aruru, the great one. You, Aruru, created the human race. Now create what Anu has commanded. To his stormy heart, let that one be equal. Let them contend with each other that Uruk may have peace. When Aruru heard this, she conceived within her what Anu commanded. Aruru wet her hands. She pinched off clay. She cast it down upon the steppe. She created a valiant Enkidu in the steppe, offspring of silence with the force of the valiant Ninorta. Shaggy with hair was his whole body. He was made lush with head hair like a woman. 
the locks of his hair grew thick as a grain field. He knew neither people nor inhabited land. He dressed as animals do. He ate grass with gazelles. With beasts he jostled at the waterhole. With wildlife he drank his fill of water. A hunter, a trapping man, encountered him at the watering hole. One day, a second, a third, he encountered him at the waterhole. When he saw him, the hunter stood stock still with terror. As for Enkidu, he went home with his beasts. The hunter was aghast, struck dumb. His feelings were in turmoil, his face drawn. There was sorrow in his heart. His face was like a traveller's from afar. The hunter made ready to speak, saying to his father, My father, there is a certain fellow who comes to the waterhole. He is the mightiest in the land, strength is his. Like the force of heaven, so mighty is his strength. He constantly ranges over the uplands, constantly eating grass with beasts, constantly making his way to the waterhole. I am too frightened to approach him. He has filled in the pits I dug. He has torn out my traps I set. He has helped the beasts, wildlife of the steppe, slip from my hands. He will not let me work the steppe. His father made ready to speak, saying to the hunter, My son, in Uruk, there is Gilgamesh. There is no one mightier than he. Like the force of heaven, so mighty is his strength. Take the road, set off toward Uruk. Tell Gilgamesh of the mightiness man. He will give you Shamhat the harlot. Take her with you. Let her prevail over him instead of a mighty man. When the wild beasts draw near the waterhole, let her strip off her clothing, laying bare her charms. When he sees her, he will approach her. The beasts that grew up with him on the steppe will deny him. Giving heed to the advice of his father, the hunter went forth. He took the road, set off toward Uruk. To the king, Gilgamesh, he said these words. There is a certain fellow who comes to the waterhole. He is the mightiest in the land, strength is his. Like the force of heaven, so mighty his strength. He constantly ranges over the uplands, constantly feeding on grass with beasts, constantly making his way to the waterhole. I am too frightened to approach him. He has filled in the pits I dug. He has torn out my traps I set. He has helped the beasts, wildlife of the steppe, slip from my hands. He will not let me work with the steppe. Gilgamesh said to him, to the hunter, Go, hunter, take with you Shamhat the harlot. When the wild beasts draw near the waterhole, let her strip off her clothing, laying bare her charms. When he sees her, he will approach her. His beasts that grew up with him on the steppe will deny him. Forth went the hunter, taking with him Shamhat the harlot. They took the road, going straight on their way. On the third day, they arrived at the appointed place. Hunter and harlot sat down to wait. One day, a second day, they sat by the waterhole. The beasts came to the waterhole to drink. The wildlife came to, uh, to drink their fill of water. But as for him, Enkidu, born in the uplands, who ate grass with gazelles, who drank at the waterhole with beasts, who, with wildlife, drank his fill of water, Shamhat looked upon him, a human man, a barbarous fellow from the depths of the steppe. There he is, Shamhat, open your embrace. Open your loins, let him take your charms. Be not bashful, take his vitality. When he sees you, he will approach you. Toss aside your clothing, let him lie upon you. Treat him, a human, to woman's work. His beasts will deny him, though he grew up with them. And in his ardour, he caresses you. Shamhat loosened her garments. She opened her loins, he took in her charms. She was not bashful, she took his vitality. She tossed aside her clothing and he lay upon her. She treated him, a human, to women's work. As in his ardour he caressed her. Six days, seven nights was Enkidu aroused, flowing into Shamhat. After he had his fill of her delights, he set off towards his beasts. When they saw him, Enkidu, the gazelles shied off. The wild beasts of the steppe shunned his person. Enkidu had polluted his uh, virginal body. His knees, his knees stood still while his beasts were going away. Enkidu was too slow, he could not run as before. But he had gained reason, broadened his understanding. He returned. He sat at the, the harlot's feet. 
The harlot was looking into his face while he listens to what the harlot was saying. The harlot said to him, to Enkidu, You are handsome, Enkidu. You are become like a god. Why roam the steppe with wild beasts? Come, let me lead you to ramparted Uruk, to the hallowed temple abode of Anu and Ishtar, the place of Gilgamesh, who is perfect in strength. And so, like a wild bull, he lords it over the young men. As she was speaking to him, her words found favour. He was yearning for one to know his heart, a friend. Enkidu said to her, to the harlot, Come, Shamhat, escort me to the lustrous hallowed temple, abode of Anu and Ishtar, the place of Gilgamesh, who is perfect in strength. And so, like a wild bull, he lords it over the young men. I myself will challenge him. I will speak out boldly. I will raise a cry in Uruk. I am the mighty one. I am the one who will change destinies. He who was born in the steppe is mighty. Strength is his. Come then, let him see your face. I will show you, Gilgamesh, where he is, I know full well. Come then, Enkidu, to ramparted Uruk, where young men are resplendent in holiday clothing, where every day is set for a celebration, where drums never stop beating, where the, and the harlots too, they are the fairest of form, rich in beauty, full of delights. Even the great gods are kept from sleeping at night. Enkidu, you who have not yet learned how to live, oh, let me show you Gilgamesh, the happiness man. Look at him, gaze upon his face. He is radiant with virility, manly vigor is his. The whole of his body is seductively gorgeous. Mightier strength has he than you, never resting by day or night. O oh, Enkidu, renounce your audacity. Gilgamesh is beloved of Shamash. Anu, Enlil, and Ea broaden his wisdom. Ere you come down from the uplands, Gilgamesh will dream of you in Uruk. Gilgamesh went to relate the dream, saying to his mother, Mother, such a dream I had last night. There were stars of heaven around me, as the force of heaven kept falling toward me. I tried to carry it, but it was too strong for me. I tried to move it, but I could not budge it. The whole of Uruk was standing beside it. The people formed a crowd around it. A throng was jostling towards it. Young men were mobbed around it. Babyish, they were fawning before it. I fell in love with it like a woman. I caressed it. I carried it off and laid it down before you. Then you were making it my partner. The mother of Gilgamesh, knowing and wise, who understands everything, said to her son, the wild cow Ninsun, knowing and wise, who understands everything, said to Gilgamesh, the stars of heaven around you as the force of heaven fell upon you. You're trying to move it, but being unable to budge it. You're lying down before me, then making it your partner. You're falling in love with it like a woman. You're caressing it. Means there will come to you a strong one, a companion who rescues a friend. He will be mighty in the land. Strength will be his. Like the forces of heaven, so mighty will be his strength. You will fall in love with him like a woman. You will caress him. He will be mighty and rescue you time and again. He had a second dream. He arose and went before the goddess, his mother. Gilgamesh said to her, to his mother, Mother, I had a second dream. An axe was cast down in a street of broad-marted Uruk. They were crowding around it. The whole of Uruk was standing beside it. The people formed a crowd around it. A throng was jostling towards it. Young men were mobbing around it. I carried it off and laid it down before you. I fell in love with it like a woman. I caressed it. Then you were making it my partner. The mother of Gilgamesh, knowing and wise, who understands everything, said to her son, the wild cow Ninsun, knowing and wise, who understands everything, said to Gilgamesh, my son, the axe you saw is a man. You're loving it like a woman, caressing it, and me, my making it your partner means there will come to you a strong one, a companion who rescues a friend. He will be mighty in the land, strength will be his. Like the strength of heaven, so mighty will be his strength. Gilgamesh said to her, to his mother, Let this befall me according to the command of the great counsellor Enlil. I want a friend for my very own confidant. For my own confidant do I want a friend. Even while he was having his dreams, Shamhat was telling the dreams of Gilgamesh to Enkidu. 
as the pair of them were making love together. That is the end of tablet one. I will just quickly scroll back and see if there are questions that need to be answered. What uh, Aunt Jess says, what is the clay pit in the city for? Um, for building. Um, Mesopotamian houses, buildings, temples were all made out of mud brick. There is almost, or there was almost nothing in the way of trees. So like building out of wood was very, very expensive. Um, and trees were generally reserved for things like temple roofing. So the mud, the clay pits would be used for getting out, obviously, clay and then using the clay to make bricks for building purposes. Um, uh, no, he wouldn't have been a Nazarene. He was this just um, the style. Uh, if you look at the palace reliefs from Ashurbanipal's palace, you can just Google them. Uh, the vast majority of the men have long hair and long beards. Just how how people, how men wore their hair. Um, let me see. Do, do, do. Aunt Jair asking step as in current day Eurasia. Yep, that's exactly what we're looking at. And not the same step, but it would have been in Mesopotamia, but that's the kind of um, geographical feature that they're describing. Um, sexual partners. If you mean Gilgamesh and Enkidu, that's depends who you ask. Um, I tend to think yes, given the like a woman language and, and the behavior later on, but it's not made explicit enough for some people to be comfortable making that connection. Uh, is uh, Uruk an historical place or based on an historical place? No, Uruk is a place in Mesopotamia. We um, we know where it is. It's been extensively excavated. Um, and this is, the story is just set in, in that city. Uh, difference between the names Enki and Enkidu. Oh, Lord. Um, so etymology of divine names is very, very difficult. It's not something I'm qualified to speak on. Um, Enki, if you're doing a folk etymology, can be translated as like Lord of the Earth. Um, en is, is Lord. Ki is the Earth and, and sometimes the underworld. Enki do, I don't honestly know how people tend to translate that. Um, I am sorry, Chuck, I can't really help you with that one. With, um, with Mesopotamian names, names of real people that like if you look at, at receipts or letters or something like that you can translate the names because they're they they are full sentences in Akkadian so um I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head I can do um Sargon the name Sargon in Akkadian is um Sharukin, which in Akkadian means the king is legitimate, the king is justified. And everyone's names were like that. And quite often they had theophoric elements. That means the names of gods built into their own personal names. So you can have something like um, Enkidu gave a son or Shamash blesses or some, something along those lines would be someone's whole name. Um, with mythological names and names of deities, it's not always that same one-to-one -one correspondence. So, and because I haven't looked into Enkidu specifically, I can't really comment on it. But that's kind of a bit of background behind Mesopotamian naming practices. Um, do Auric and Or originate in the same period? Um, yeah, kind of. I mean, the occupation history is different for both cities, but I... And, dates are not my strong suit because as previously mentioned I have ADHD and dates tend to fall out of my head unless I am looking straight at them or I've read them within the next th last three minutes so um both very ancient cities um Uruk is what we generally term the first city in human history uh so I don't think or is goes back quite as long um as Uruk does but yes and they're both obviously Mesopotamia. Um, 
is sexual sexuality as a culture or civilization or oh, human making element mentioned elsewhere or is this the only example <sighs> it's a very good question and i don't know i want to say this is the only one but it's Nothing is springing to mind, um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other examples that I'm not aware of or that I have forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Ray answering the question about dating or as much later than Uruk. There we go. Um, thank you, Ray. I can always count on people in the chat to catch me when I make mistakes. Uh, so Aunt Jerry again, when they say to fall in love like a woman, do they mean fall in love with the other person as if that person was a woman? Ah, or to fall in love in the same manner that a woman falls in love? Um, that is an excellent question. And I've always taken it to be falling in love as if the other person was a woman. And there's there are a few passages later on that kind of um, I feel back that up. Um, but without going back and looking at the the grammar in the Akkadian, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I believe to fall in love as if the other person was a woman. Uh, does Benjamin Foster translate primary sources? Yes, he absolutely does. Um, I don't know if he has. If you get um, Sorry, if you get Andrew George's most recent edition, he does actually have a list of tablets. Um, this is this particular copy is intended for a more general readership than um, Andrew George's big two volume translation. Uh, but yes, Dr. Foster is um, he's a sorry, he's I'm just looking at his the bio at the beginning um yes essentially he's an Assyriologist he he will be translated from the Akkadian um okay so I'm going to change the slide because aha I can do that and I'm going to go on to tablet two while Enkidu was seated before the harlot the pair of them were making love together Enkidu forgot the step where he was born Six days, seven nights was Enkidu aroused, flowing into Shamhat. The harlot said to him, to Enkidu, As I look at you, Enkidu, you are become like a god. Why roam the steppe with wild beasts? Come, let me lead you to broad-marted Uruk, to the hallowed temple abode of Anu. Up then, Enkidu, let me lead you to broad-marted Uruk, to Ayana, abode of Anu, where they do things that long abide, and you too, like a man, can make something of yourself. You already know where the shepherd ranges. He heard what she said, accepted her words. The council of Shamhat touched his heart. She took off her clothing, with one piece she dressed him, the second she herself put on. Clasping his hand, she led him as if he were a god, to the shepherd's hut where the sheepfold was. The shepherds crowded around him. They said to themselves of their own accord, this fellow, how like Gilgamesh in stature, in stature tall, proud as a battlement. I am sure, being born in the steppe, he was nursed on the milk of wild beasts. They set bread before him, they set beer before him. Enkidu did not eat the bread. He eyed it uncertainly and then stared. Enkidu, Enkidu did not know how to eat bread, nor had he ever learned to drink beer. The harlots made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, Drink the bread, Enkidu, the staff of life. Drink the beer, the custom of the land. Enkidu ate the bread until he was sated. He drank seven jugglets of the beer. His mood became relaxed. He was singing joyously. He felt light-hearted and his features glowed. A barber treated his hairy body. He anointed himself with oil, turned into a man. He put on clothing, became like a warrior. He took his weapons, did battle with lions. As the shepherd rested at night, he slew many wolves, defeated many lions. The head herdsman lay down to sleep. Enkidu was their watchman, a wakeful man. He was having fun with Shamhat. 
He lifted his eyes. He saw a man. He said to the harlot, Shamhat, bring that man here. Why has he come? I will ask him to account for himself. The harlot summoned the man. He came over. Enkidu said to him, Fellow, where are you? What rushing? What is this, your wearisome errand? The man made ready to speak, said to Enkidu, They have invited me to a wedding. Is it not people's custom to get married? I have heaped high on the festival tray the fancy dishes for the wedding. For the king of ramparted Uruk, the people's veils are open for his choosing. For Gilgamesh, king of broad-marted Uruk, the people's, the people's veils are open for his choosing. He mates with the lawful wife, wife, he first, the groom after. By divine decree pronounced, from the cutting of, the, of his umbilical cord, she is his due. At the man's account, his face went pale. Enkidu was walking in front, with Shamhat behind him. When he entered the street of broad-marted Uruk, a multitude crowded around him. He stood there in the street of broad-marted Uruk, with the people crowding around him. They said about him, He is equal to Gilgamesh in build. Though shorter in stature, he is stronger of frame. I am sure, being born in the steppe, he is nursed on the milk of wild beasts. The whole of Uruk was standing beside him. The people formed a crowd around him. A throng was jostling toward him. Young men were mobbed around him. Babyish, they were fawning before him. In Uruk, the sacrifices were as usual. The young men were jubilant. Against the young man headed straight on his way, a champion stood ready. Against the godlike Gilgamesh, a rival stood ready. For the goddess of lovemaking, the bed was made. Gilgamesh was to join with the girl that night. Enkidu approached him. They met in the public street. Enkidu blocked the door to the wedding with his foot, not allowing Gilgamesh to enter. They grappled with each other, crouching like bulls. They shattered the doorpost. The wall shook. Gilgamesh and Enkidu grappled with each other, crouching like bulls. They shattered the doorpost. The wall shook. They grappled with each other at the door of the wedding. They fought in the streets, the public square. It was Gilgamesh who knelt for the win his foot on the ground. His fury abated, he turned away. After he turned away, Enkidu said, Enkidu said to Gilgamesh, As one unique did your mother bear you, the wild cow of the ramparts, Ninsun, exalted you above the most valorous of men. Enlil has granted you kingship over the people. They kissed each other and made friends. I have found the friend, the confidant whom I saw in my dreams. Enkidu, the confidant who I saw in my dreams. Enkidu said to her, to Harlot, Come, Harlot, let me do something good for you, because you brought me to Ramparted Uruk, because you showed me a fine companion, a friend. So I should probably point out here, you'll notice there are gaps in the narrative, and that's because we don't have a complete version of this. The translations we do have have been pieced together from fragments um, of different tablets. So where you hear me, kind of jump in the the narration is because there's there's a gap and we don't we don't know what goes in that gap so if it's a little little confusing then I'm, I'm sorry that's unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that um okay so Gilgamesh is talking to Ninsen he is the mighty in the land strength is his like the force of heaven so mighty is his strength in stature tall proud as a battlement the mother of, mother of Gilgamesh made ready to speak, said to Gilgamesh, Ninsun, the wild cow, made ready to speak, and said to Gilgamesh, My son, Enkidu has neither father nor mother. He was overgrown with hair. He was born in the steppe. And there's a whole load of speech that we believe foretells Enkidu's death, which is always a fun thing to hear. And then the narrative picks back up again. Enkidu froze. He heard what she said. He thought about it and collapsed. His eyes filled with tears. His heart felt resentment. He sighed bitterly. Enkidu's eyes filled with tears. His heart filled with resentment. He sighed bitterly. He was listless. His strength turned to weakness. They clasped each other. They joined hands. Gilgamesh said, felt sorry for him, saying to Enkidu, Why do your eyes fill with tears? Your heart feel resentment. You sigh bitterly. Why are you listless? Your strength turns to weakness. Enkidu said to him, to Gilgamesh, Cries of sorrow, my friend, have cramped my muscles. 
I am listless. My strength turns to weakness. Fear has made its way into my heart. Gilgamesh made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, There dwells in the forest a fierce monster, Humbaba. You and I shall kill him and wipe out something evil from the land. Let us surprise him in his dwelling. Enkidu made ready to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, My friend, I knew of him in the steppe when I roamed with the wild beasts. The forest is a wilderness, sixty double leagues in every direction. Who can go into it? Humbaba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His moor is fire, his breath is death. The dwelling of Humbaba is a hopeless quest. Gilgamesh made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, My friend, I must go up the mountain. We have a gap. And Enkidu replies, Enkidu made ready to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, How shall the likes of us go to the forest of cedars, my friend? In order to safeguard the forest of cedars, Enlil appointed him to frighten off the people. Enlil ordained him several di seven direful radiances. That journey is not to be undertaken. That creature is not to be looked upon. The guardian of the forest of cedars, Humbaba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His moor is fire, his breath is death. He can hear rustling in the forest for sixty double leagues. Who can go into his forest? Adad is first and Humbaba is second. Who, even among the gods, could attack him? In order to safeguard the forest of cedars, Enlil appointed him to frighten off the people. Enlil ordained him seven direful radiances. Besides, whoever goes into his forest, numbness overpowers him. Gilgamesh made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, Who, my friend, can go up to heaven? The gods took up their dwellings in the light of the sun, but people's days are numbered whenever they attempt in, whatever they attempt is a puff of air. Here you are, even you, afraid of death. What good is your bravery's might? I can go before you. You can call out to me. Go on, be not afraid. If I fail, I'll have established my name. Gilgamesh, who joined battle with fierce Humbaba, they'll say. You who were born and grew up on the steppe, when lions sprang at you, you knew what to do. Young men fled before you. The evening star came out for you, but now you talk like a weakling. How you puel, you make me ill. I must set my hand to cutting a cedar tree. I must establish eternal fame. Come, my friends, let's be off to the foundry. Let them cast axes such as we'll need. Off they went, hand in hand, to the workshop. The craftsmen seated around conferred. They cast great axes, axe blades weighing 180 pounds each they cast. They cast great daggers. Their blades were 120 pounds each. The fittings of the daggers were 30 pounds of gold. Gilgamesh and Enkidu bore 10 times 60 pounds each. He bolted the seven gates of Uruk. He summoned the assembly, the multitude convened. All of the land turned out in a street of broad-marted Uruk. Gilgamesh took his place upon his throne in a street of broad-marted Uruk. Enkidu sat before him. Gilgamesh spoke to the elders of broad-marted Uruk. Hear me, O elders of broad-marted Uruk, the god of whom they speak, I, Gilgamesh, would see, the one whose name resounds across the whole world. I will hunt him down in the forest of cedars. I will make the land hear how mighty is the scion of Uruk. I will set my hand to cutting a cedar, an eternal name I will make for myself. Hear me, O young men of ramparted Uruk, young men of Uruk who understand this cause. I have taken up a noble quest. I travel a distant road to where Humbaba is. I face a battle I do not know. I mount a campaign I do not know. Give me your blessing that I may go that I may indeed see your faces safely again, that I may indeed re-enter joyfully the gate of ramparted Uruk, that I may indeed return to hold the New Year festival twice in a year. May that festival be held, the fanfare sound. May the drums resound before the wild cow Ninsun. Enkidu pressed advice upon the elders, upon the young men of Uruk who understood this cause. Tell him he must not go to the forest of cedars, that journey is not to be undertaken. That being is not to be looked upon. The guardian of the forest, Humbaba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His moor is fire, his breath is death. He can hear rustling in the forest for sixty double leagues. Whoever goes into his forest, 
Numbness overpowers him. Who can go into his forest? Adad is first and Humbaba is second. Who, even among the gods, could attack him? In order to safeguard the forest of cedars, Enlil appointed him to frighten off the people. Enlil ordained him seven direful radiances. The elders of Ramparted Uruk arose. They responded to Gilgamesh with their advice. You are young, Gilgamesh. Your courage carries you away. You are ignorant of what you speak. You do not know what you are attempting. We hear of Humbaba that his features are eerie. Who is there who could face his weaponry? He can hear rustling in the forest for sixty double leagues. Whoever goes into his forest, numbness overpowers him. Who can go into it? Humbaba's cry is the roar of a deluge. His maw is fire. His breath is death. Adad is first and Humbaba is second. Who, even among the gods, could attack him? In order to safeguard the forest of cedars, Enlil appointed him to frighten off the people. Enlil ordained him seven direful references. When Gilgamesh heard the speech of his counsellors, he looked towards his friends and laughed. Now then, my friends, do you say the same? Am I too afraid to approach him? I must go. I will slay Gilgamesh, uh, I will slay Humbaba like a lion. I will lash together logs of cedar, cypress, and evergreen trees. I will gather the boughs upon it. I will cut off Humbaba's head and I will navigate downstream. And then we have the end of tablet two. So for those who did not catch it, um, we have uh, Enkidu confronting Gilgamesh when Gilgamesh was about to exercise his right of prima nocta, uh, which is the king's right to uh, have sex with a virgin on her wedding night, which Gilgamesh apparently has, and no one seems terribly thrilled about this. Excuse me. Um, so Enkidu confronts him, they fight, and then they're best friends. And uh, Ninsun, Gilgamesh's mother, uh, interprets a dream that he has had and says, this means that Enkidu will die. Enkidu, understandably, is not thrilled by this news um, and becomes very sad and scared and understandably does not want to die. And Gilgamesh effectively laughs at him and says, everyone's going to die. And the best way that we can um, gain any kind of immortality is by making a name for ourselves. So this quest to defeat Humbaba and come back with uh, cypress trees is and cedar trees is Gilgamesh's the start of Gilgamesh's quest for an eternal name. And Enkidu, who is familiar with Humbaba, is saying this is not a good idea. Everyone else is saying this is not a good idea. And Gilgamesh is going to go ahead with it anyway. So we have some questions. Uh, was the flood of Noah in Genesis from the Epic of Gilgamesh? Um, I am not going to say if it was from the Epic of Gilgamesh. There are very strong similarities, I suspect. And I've got a video elsewhere that talks about this, that the flood narrative in Gilgamesh was heavily based on that that we see later on in, in Gilgamesh. You have um, a lot of similarities, including the, the three birds that get sent out. Um, and the interesting thing, so I, I said at the beginning of answering your question that I'm not going to say it was. I, yes, I think, I think it was um, inspired heavily by what we see in Gilgamesh. Um, the the Israelites took it and reworked it to say something very different. And I think the way that they did that is very clever. And again, there's a, another video on the channel if you want to take a look at it. I think it's, I can't remember the title, but if you search plagiarism or Epic of Gilgamesh, then it'll pop up. Um, yes, so very interesting. Uh, why is the writing of this so much better than the Torah creatively? I don't agree that it's better than the Torah. So I think that's a matter of personal opinion. Do, do, do. Um, again, with the floods, uh, there is an arguable inspiration from Gilgamesh. I think the one in Gilgamesh is a cliff notes of Atrahasis. Yes, um, the original flood narrative is in a Sumerian composition. The Gilgamesh epic I'm reading to you is in Akkadian. It's not as old as the Sumerian literature. And um, there is a, a flood narrative in Sumerian called Atrahasis. Uh, yes, Prima Nocta, we covered that. Briefly, uh, do, do, do. sorry, I'm just making sure I don't miss any questions. Ah, good question. How big are these tablets? Tablet one seems rather longish. They're long. They're big. They're not like if you 
see a tablet, a clay tablet in museums, oftentimes they're little either letters or receipts from sales. Um, literary tablets are much, much longer, um, like this-ish, and they're double-sided. Um, so yes, they are large, large tablets. Uh, sorry. Uh, is the name Uruk the origin of the name Iraq? It's not a stupid question. I do not know the answer. That's an excellent question. I've never actually thought about it. Yeah. Very interesting. I don't know, and I don't know how to find out. Uh, how difficult is Akkadian compared to other ancient languages? Are there good sources to learn it? Um, Akkadian, it, relatively straightforward. Actually, it's a Semitic language. So if you know a Semitic language already, Arabic or Hebrew, um, then you're already on good footing. It's pretty regular, grammatically speaking. And there are good sources to learn it. There is um, a learn to read ancient, or teach yourself ancient Babylonian, I think it's called by Martin Worthington, which is excellent, um, meant for someone with no background in, um, oh, sorry, meant for someone with no background in ancient languages. Um, it's got a bunch of exercises for you to go through. If you want something that's a little meatier than the standard reference, well, not reference, the standard book that Assyriologists use um, when they're, they're going through it is called Hunegard's uh, Grammar of Akkadian or something, but it's like this big and giant green book. Um, it's, it's much more technical. It's also much more detailed than the Martin Worthington one. So if you go through Worthington and you need some more detail, then Hunegard is, is an excellent choice as well. There's also some web resources. Uh, Eleanor Robeson, I think, put out um, like a little website on ORAC, which is the openly richly annotated cuneiform corpus. I think if you Google knowledge and power Akkadian language, you'll come up with the resource that I'm thinking about. I never managed to find the actual web address of it, or I never managed to remember it. Um, but yes, excellent, excellent resources. Learning Akkadian is actually a lot easier than learning Sumerian because there's there's just a lot more out there for you to be working on. Uh, who is responsible for inventing and creating the writing? Um, the people living in Mesopotamia, uh, fourth millennium BCE. I can't give you a name, I'm afraid. I don't think anyone really knows. Um, but you get writing being used for um, keeping track of uh, offerings to temples and that kind of thing. It was an administrative tool long before it was used to write down literature or even parts of speech. There, I think we have a video on the development of writing. Um, Yes, we do. We've got, actually got an interview on the invention of writing. It's one of the earlier interviews, so apologies, my interview skills have come a long way since then. But if you uh, go and check out the channel, there's a bunch of stuff on, on the invention of writing that you can look at. Aunt Jer, how did they write on the back without smashing the words on the front? They let the tablets dry in the sun first. Um, yeah, pretty much. So you don't, a lot of the time you don't get, the clay is not necessarily fired in an oven, it's left out to bake in the sun. Uh, and then people so no because that's a good question because then if it's dried then presumably the back was dried as well oh that is a good question oh i need to find an experimental archaeologist and ask them that oh i know who i can ask i can ask jeremiah peterson if you don't know dr peterson he's wonderful he also has an etsy shop where he makes replicas of cuneiform tablets they're beautiful we have a couple that are not in this room currently. It's um, Modern Scribe Ancient Text, I think, or Ancient Text Modern Scribe is the name of his shop. Highly recommended. But I will ask him how he does it because he does manage it. And I, yeah, good question. I don't know. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sorry. Um, from Luru, do I think Kumbaba could represent an older animistic entity or deity in Kalinkan? I, so I don't know. For me, that would be a lot of speculation that I don't feel comfortable making. Uh, 
so he has apotropaic qualities in later period. Well, no, actually, in, in the period that this was this was written, in, we find uh, clay models of his face, like a big monstrous face, that is protective, essentially. Um, and I've lost my page, um, but I don't. I mean, I, I suppose you could make the argument that the Cedar Forest was outside of Uruk's control. So killing Humbaba gave him control over the Cedar Forest. So it's like a cultural, maybe a cultural memory of, of a conflict. But I, that is a lot of speculation and I, I can't back it up. So I don't know. But excellent question. Um, okay, good. I am all caught up with questions. Thank you, everyone. This is... Very interesting. How long have we been going? Nearly an hour. Okay. Well, given this thing has 11 tablets and we've been going for an hour and I've got through two, we may have to split this into several, uh, several sessions because much as I enjoy Gilgamesh, um, I don't think I can sit here and read all of the rest of it. I did maybe overestimate my own abilities. Hmm. Well, let's keep going until my brain stops working. Should we do that? Yeah, that sounds good. Tablet three. The elders spoke to him. Sorry, I'm going to switch my slide back so that everyone can find the book if they wanted. The elders spoke to him, saying to Gilgamesh, come back safely to Uruk's haven. Trust not Gilgamesh in your strength alone. Let your eyes see all. Make your blow strike home. He who goes in front saves his companion. He who knows the path protects his friend. Let Enkidu walk before you. He knows the way to the forest of cedars. He has seen battle, been exposed to combat. Let Enkidu protect his friend, safeguard his companion. Let him return to be a grave husband. We in the assembly entrust the king to you. On your return, entrust the king to us. Sorry, I forget that I have my tea. Gilgamesh made ready to speak, saying to Enkidu, Come, my friends, let us go to the sublime temple, to go before Ninsun, the great queen. Ninsun, the wise, who is versed in all knowledge, will send us on our way with good advice. Clasping each other hand in hand, Gilgamesh and Enkidu went to the sublime temple, to go before Ninsun, the great queen. Gilgamesh came forward and entered before her, Gilgamesh said to her, to Ninsun, O Ninsun, I have taken up a noble quest. I travel a distant road to where Humbaba is. To face a battle I do not know, to mount a campaign I do not know. Give me your blessing that I may go, that I may indeed see your face safely again, that I may indeed re-enter joyfully the gate of ramparted Uruk, that I may indeed return to hold a New Year festival twice in a year that I may indeed celebrate the New Year festival twice in a year. May that festival be held, the fanfare sound. May the drums resound before you. The wild cow Ninsun heard them out with sadness, the speeches of Gilgamesh, her son, and Enkidu. Ninsun entered the bathhouse seven times. She bathed herself in water with tamarisk and soap wort. She put on a garment as beseemed her body. She put on an ornament as beseemed her breast. She, uh, something, we don't know what, was in place. She was wearing her tiara. She climbed the staircase, mounted to the roof terrace. She went up onto the roof, set up an incense offering to Shamash. She made the offering. To Shamash, she raised her hands in prayer. Why did you endow my son Gilgamesh with a restless heart? Now you have moved him to travel a distant road to where Humbaba is, to fight a battle he does not know, to mount a campaign he does not know. Until he goes and returns, until he reaches the forest of cedars, until he has slain fierce Humbaba and wipes out from the land the evil thing you hate, in a day when you trans traverse the boundaries of the sky, may Aya, your bride, not hesitate to remind you Entrust him to the watchman of the night. O Shamash, you opened the mountains for the beasts of the steppe. You came out for the land. The mountains glow, the heavens brighten. The beasts of the steppe behold your fierce radiance. The dying man finds life through you. You incline your head to judges. 
At your light's rising, the multitudes assemble. The great gods stand in attendance upon your glow. May Aya, your bride, not hesitate to remind you, entrust him to the watchman of the night. While Gilgamesh journeys to the forest of cedars, may the days be long, may the nights be short. May his loins be girded, his stride be strong. At night, let him make camp for sleeping. Let them lie down for the night. May Aya, your bride, not hesitate to remind you, entrust him to the watchman of the night. When Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and Humbaba meet, raise up for his sake, O Shamash, great winds against Humbaba. South wind, north wind, east wind, west wind, moaning wind, blasting wind, lashing wind, contrary wind, dust storm, demon wind, freezing wind, storm wind, whirlwind. Let thirteen winds rise that Humbaba's face be darkened. Then let Gilgamesh's weapons defeat Humbaba. As soon as your own radiance flares forth, at that very moment, O Shamash, look to the man who reveres you. May your swift mules convey you. A comfortable seat, a fragrant bed is laid for you. May the gods, your brethren, serve you your favorite food. May Aya, the great bride, dab your face with the fringe of her spotless garment. The wild cow Ninsun made a second plea to Shamash. O Shamash, will not Gilgamesh become a judge among the gods? Will he not share heaven with you? Will he not share a scepter with the moon? Will he not be a sage with Ea in the depths? Will he not rule the human race with Anuna? Will he not dwell with Ningishida in the land of no return? After the wild cow Ninsun had made her plea, the wild cow Ninsun the wise, who was versed in all knowledge, snuffed the incense, she came down from the roof terrace. She summoned Enkidu to impart her message. Mighty, mighty Enkidu, now you are no issue of my womb, your offspring shall be among the devotees of Gilgamesh, the priestesses, votaries, cult women of the temple. She placed a token around Enkidu's neck. The priestesses have hereby taken in this foundling, and the daughters of the gods will bring up this foster child. I herewith take Enkidu, who was born in the steppe, for my adopted son. May Gilgamesh en treat Enkidu well, as a brother should. While your journey with him to the forest of cedars, a while you journey with him to the forest of cedars, may your days be long, may the nights be short, may your loins be girded, your stride be strong. At night, make a camp for sleeping. We have another break here. Um, it looks like Gilgamesh has gone to the temple of Shamash to ask for an oracle. Gilgamesh was kneeling before Shamash. The words he spoke. I am going, O Shamash, to the place of Humbaba. Let me be safe there. Keep me alive. Bring me back to the haven of broad-marted Uruk. P Excuse me. Place your protection upon me. Tears were pouring down Gilgamesh's face. I will take, my God, a road I have never travelled. I will take, my God, a road I do not know. Let me return here safely. Let me gaze on you as long as I like. I will build a house for your delight. I will seat you on your thrones. I have another gap. Um, they are still in Uruk, and when the gap resume, uh, when the text resumes, Gilgamesh is giving instructions to everyone for how Uruk should run when he is not there. The young men should not form a crowd in the street. Judge the lawsuit of the weak. Call the powerful to account. While we have it our way, as children do, and set up our battle standard at Humbaba's gate. His dignitaries stood by, wishing him well. In a crowd, the young one of Uruk ran along behind him, while his dignitaries made obeisance to him. Come back safely to Uruk's haven. Trust not, Gilgamesh, in your strength alone. Let your eyes see all, make your blows strike home. He who goes in front saves his companion. He who knows the path protects his friend. Let Enkidu walk before you. He knows the way to the forest of cedars. He has seen battle, been exposed to combat. Let Enkidu protect his friend, safeguard his companion. Let him return to be a grave husband. We in our assembly entrust the king to you. On your return, entrust the king to us. We have a brief 
break and Enkidu is attempting to talk Gilgamesh out of it. He says, turn back, my friend, you must not make this journey. Um, we have more from the elders. The elders hailed him, counseled Gilgamesh for the journey. Trust not Gilgamesh in your own strength. Let your vision be clear. Take care of yourself. Let Enkidu go before you. He has seen the road, has traveled the way. He knows the ways into the forest. All the tricks of Humbaba, who goes first, oh, he knows the ways into the forest and all the tricks of Humbaba. He who goes first safeguards his companion. His vision is clear. He protects himself. May Shamash help you find your goal. May your eyes show you the things you have spoken of. May he open for you the barred road. Make straight the pathway to your tread. Make straight the upland to your feet. May nightfall bring you good tidings. May Lugalbanda stand by you in your cause. Have it your way as children do. Wash your feet in the river of Humbaba whom you seek. When you stop for the night, dig a well. May there always be pure water in your water skin. You should libate cool water to Shamash and be mindful of Lugalbanda. Enkidu made ready to speak, saying to Gilgamesh, As you insist, make the journey. Do not be afraid. Watch me. I know his dwelling in the forest and the pathways where Humbaba goes. We have some very fragmentary speech that ends the tablet. Uh, the young men... Um, saying to Gilgamesh, go Gilgamesh, may your God go by your side, may Shamash help you to your God. And then we have a gap. And then we have tablet four. So I don't know if you were noticing my, uh, I'm stumbling over more words than I would like, so I am going to leave it there. We're just at an hour, so I, th I think that's reasonable. Um, so I will be back tomorrow, probably not the same time, because I believe I'm recording something else tomorrow at 11, but I will put the stream up um, sometime today so you can check back um, and see when that is. It will be maybe around noon or 1 p.m. ED, uh, EST, so I hope that works for you all. Uh, we have one question. Ray asks what may his loins be girded means, and RAF very kindly answered it for us. Uh, yes, I believe that is correct, but I am not an expert, so don't necessarily trust my word for it. Uh, I'm glad everybody enjoyed. I enjoyed as well. I like reading ancient literature. I don't get to do it terribly often. Uh, if there are any more questions about that last tablet, I nearly said chapter. It's not a chapter. Any more questions about that last tablet? Otherwise, I will go and uh, have some lunch. Actually, I'm hungry. I'm just going to like hang out for a minute until people have a chance to ask questions if they want. I'm assuming no, because there weren't many coming in as we were going. No? Okay. I will be back tomorrow with the next three tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's four, five, and six. So we'll get through the Humbaba stuff. Um, poor Humbaba. He's just hanging out in his forest, and then this upstart king comes and cuts his head off. It's just... Rude, honestly, very rude. Very, very rude. I understand the quest for immortality and, and making a name for oneself, but I have to go and cut off Fumbaba's head. <sighs> anyway, we will be back tomorrow. Bring your questions if you have questions. If I can answer them, I will. If I can't, then I'll tell you I can't uh, and make my best possible guesses. Thank you for coming. It was lovely to see you all. Have a lovely afternoon. I'll see you tomorrow. Digital Hammurabi is made possible by generous sponsorship from our patrons. Their support means that we have the technological and academic resources necessary to bring the ancient world directly to you. If you want to join the team, go to patreon.com forward slash digital Hammurabi to see how you can help.